heard it as well. All sorts of silly things said about the Bible. It's full of contradictions. It's been translated so many times, it bears no resemblance to what was written. The gospel writers have made it all up, they've changed the stories, they've exaggerated this, that and the other. Does this ring bells? Does this ring bells? It's what you hear, and worse. Because at the end of the day, people want to put the Bible down, pull it apart, because they don't want to listen to it. Because when you listen to it, it's a bit powerful because it's got the Holy Spirit behind it. And the actions of God over four plus thousand years, I say four plus thousand years because I tend to do my thinking from my namesake, Abram, who was 2000 BC. Before that, it's sort of prehistory in my book. What I want to focus on, because it's been, it's running my mind and it's growing. You know, things grow. It's a bit like Popsy. She just grows, isn't she? Uh, there's things grown in my mind from things I preached a few years ago to things I said a couple of years ago or three years ago. And, and they're still growing, which is good. It's good and healthy for me. For you, it means you're going to have to have a bit more to say. <laughs> That's me pulling your leg. What I want to start, where I want to start from is Jesus, the perfect Perfect strategist. And you'll see where I'm going in, as I go along. Jesus, the perfect strategist. When he spent time in the wilderness, he got a plan. And there's only one plan, and there is only one plan. It's the plan that was laid down from the start to south, uh, from the, before the creation of the world, because God formed you. Uh, read Ephesians 1, you were chosen from before the creation. So it all goes back. There was a plan all along. But in the wilderness, he looks at that and thinks about it and prays about it. He's meditating, I'm pretty sure, on the book of Isaiah. And he comes on the scene in Mark, because he brings you in quickly, which is where the public perception and reception of Jesus starts, actually, at the baptism of John the Baptist. All the rest, uh, the birth stories, are prequels that are put in, importantly, told by Mary and Joseph to help us understand a little bit more. Nobody at the time of Jesus knew those uh, that account. If I use the word story, it'd be the account, because I don't like the word story, and I try not to use it. He comes preaching the kingdom and repentance. He is the Messiah, and he's got a tread to path. John the Baptist has prepared it for the one who is the coming one. But Jesus then sets out a very careful process of handling why he's come. He knows where he's headed. He knows he's going to the cross. He knows who he is. It's there he wrestles with it in the wilderness. If you are the Son of God. At his baptism he hears it. You're my son. He knows he's the Son of God. He knows he's the eternal word become flesh. I think he probably knows that. Um, I think. But it's a very careful, measured presentation and revelation of what it's all about for a few reasons. Firstly, the political expectation was for the Messiah to lead and raise up a Jewish army, a great big revolt, kick the Romans out and establish a powerful kingdom and conquer the kingdoms of the world. If you think about it in the wilderness, all this I will give you clear off saying, that's not the way. My kingdom is different. So in the first part of his ministry, Jesus focuses on demonstrating the presence of the kingdom, the power of the kingdom, the authority of the kingdom, who he is very, very gently, because he doesn't want to rub things up too quickly. He doesn't want people to understand him as the Messiah. Because otherwise they're going to push him. If you remember in Luke, there was an attempt to make him king. They got the wrong head and he, he buzzes off. He, he, he gets on a number 10 bus and goes down the road. Because he doesn't want it. He clears off. He certainly doesn't want him crabbing hold too much about him being the son of God or God become man. And I mean, that ruptures out when he heals the paralyzed man and forgives sins. Only God can forgive sins today. The boy's at the back of the room, naughty boy. And he demonstrates who he is, but he's always keeping it little man, and he's keeping it carefully under wraps, because he doesn't want things to erupt 
too soon. His hour has to come. And if you think about it in the Gospels, there's a thing about his hour had not yet come. I think that's John. His hour had not yet come. And that's very, very important. He's heading towards it, but he's measured and careful all the way. And that's why he teaches in parables. So that people can see and hear and all the rest of it, but not really understand. But the teaching is there on the nature of the kingdom. And he grows that on to show that the nature of his kingdom is not a kingdom of power and authority and lordship, but a, a kingdom of service, sacrifice and giving. Completely opposite. But he's careful and he spends a lot of time doing this. Of course his disciples are three sheets to the wind. They don't understand hardly a word of what he's saying. But they like the guy and he gives him a picnic now and again so they go with him. And there's something special about him. There's something attractive. He's called them and they feel something very, very good about him. So they keep there. They go with him and they're there. But I don't think they really understand him. And that comes out. And that's important as well. Their lack of understanding and a comprehension comes out through the Gospels. You might want to hold that in something I say later. Then part way through, well through, he says, who do people say I am? Oh, you are the Bible, John the Baptist, the prophet, this, that and the other. And what about you? Who do you say? You're the Messiah. Oh, we have got there. Yeah, I'm the Messiah, but I've got a little bit of news for you. I'm going to be the suffering servant as well. I'm going to go down to Jerusalem. I'm going to be rejected. Uh, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. I'm going to rise again. And oh my goodness, the, 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 the hands are over the ears. They just can't cope with it. And he tells them three times. But they cannot cope with it. Goes nowhere. But Jesus has a plan and he sticks to it. And whether they understand it or not, he has a timetable and an agenda. And he pursues it gently and carefully, all the way. And then, five days before the cross, he arrives in Jerusalem and he allows the messianic acclamation of Palm Sunday. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Quoting what are clearly messianic psalms. He allows them. The Pharisees pick it up. Tell them to shut up. If I shut them up, the stones will cry out. And then, and he's actually saying, my hour has come. And in that week, he does that. But there is one thing he holds, I think, to the last minute. And I want to change direction. We're going to go back a little bit. Because have you ever considered where in the New Testament, I've been discussing this quite a bit recently, I've asked the question, where is the explanation and unpacking of why Jesus actually came to down the cross? All this, all the kingdom stuff is there and the cross as we know is the way into the kingdom and is the, 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 the ultimate kingdom value. But where is it? If you think, and, and the synoptics and John handle it very differently. Because in the synoptics, there's virtually nothing whatsoever. There's Matthew and Mark, both quote the, uh, Jesus as saying, uh, when he's been talking about the servanthood of the kingdom, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, you and I hear the word ransom, we think, oh yes, he died on the cross for me. They didn't because they didn't know about the cross. And then when you go into John, right on at the beginning, you've got, behold, from John the Baptist, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, there's a little clue in that, but I don't think people understood it, and they certainly couldn't see anything of the cross. And then in John 3, when he's talking to Nicodemus, there's a couple of interesting things there. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. We know him. And when we hear that, we think of the cross. But actually, when Jesus says, God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, it's not just giving him to the cross. It's the whole act of giving Jesus. And when he talks of Moses lifting up the serpent and the Son of Man being lifted up, we see the cross, but nobody else did at the time. We write him, and understand it, but he can. But it was not clear that he's talking about the cross. When he talks about himself as the good shepherd in John 10, he says interesting things there. And about him laying down his life for the sheep. Well, all right, 
if you think back to David, uh, when he's standing in the, the, the shadow of Goliath, and everybody stood in the shadow of Goliath because he was so big. Um, and, and, and he says, I'm not frightened of him, I fought bears and lions. In other words, he's prepared to put his life on the line. But again, when Jesus said, I'm going to lay down my life for the sheep, I don't think they would understand what he's saying. The most interesting thing he says in that passage is, I have authority to lay down my life and authority to take it up again. That is extremely challenging. But again, he does not speak about what he's going to do. It's all held as I now see it. And I've only seen it in the last few weeks. It shows you how slow I am. It's taken me 50 years to get to this point. 50 years. So there's hope for us all. It's taken me 50. I think I've got there. He holds it all. But I want to ask one other question. Shall I ask it now? Shall I pause for a minute? I'm not looking at my notes at all. I don't know where on earth I am. Um, I'm following you, but not in, with my eye. Um, shall we have that? No, let, he holds it all till about 8 o'clock on Thursday evening. Are you with me? The night before he goes to the cross. And just with the 12 of them, one of them goes out, and I can't remember whether he goes out before he full suffers a walk. Just for that, it doesn't matter. But they're celebrating a meal. The meal of salvation. The meal of deliverance. The meal when they were released from slavery in Egypt and put on the path to the promised land. This is Jesus the strategist. And the blood of the Lamb saved them from the angel of the Passover of death. And he takes some bread. As they did. And he gave thanks and he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. And there's a few cups of wine in the Passover. And with the final and fourth cup, he says, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this. In remembrance of me. So he's changed the salvation meal of the last 1600 years, a bit more, a bit less, sorry, 1500 years, is that about right? 14, 1500 years into a new salvation meal, and he's just taken the lid off the whole thing as to how the kingdom is going to be, and invited people to look in and to explore. <clears throat> and that's it. Unless he explains it on the road to Emmaus and in one of those Bible studies post-resurrection, but not one of them reflects it. We're still going to hold that question. So the next thing I want to say, all this nonsense about made up, exaggerated, this, that and the other, <clears throat> is a load of nonsense because the gospel writers in their own way, three, three in one way and one in another, are completely holding an integrity and although they utilise the sayings of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus to make points, they actually stick faithfully and completely because they're working under the power of the Holy Spirit to the strategy of Jesus. They do not blow the bolts and go back and read it backwards. They're not reading back through the ministry of Jesus, the cross. They're not bringing it out. They're not stressing it. They're leaving it until that last minute as Jesus did. And I mean, it could only be that way because you can't make it up like that. This is as it happened. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John are true to the life and the ministry and the strategy of Jesus in the way he revealed his purpose and his plan and he executed that purpose and plan. And there's three little dots. You know what three little dots mean, don't you? Yeah. Therefore, read the word of God with confidence, with assurance, knowing it's accurate, helpful, faithful and true. And if that is the case for here, it's true for the whole lot. For the whole lot. God's not going to just preserve one little bit, he preserves the whole lot. 
All scripture is God-breathed and profitable, all of it, and that includes Paul's writing who wrote those words. Now to my next little question. We haven't even, got, we haven't even finished the introduction yet. <laughs> Have you thought why Jesus did not pick a Pharisee to be a disciple? He chose fishermen, a tax collector, uh, others we don't know their backgrounds and occupation, but ordinary artisans, working men. Have you considered why he didn't choose a Pharisee? I hadn't until recently, but I think the answer comes out simply when you look at I mean, we've got Nicodemus. Nicodemus has a lovely conversation, and Nicodemus is there after the cross. So he's taking it seriously. But he's not invited in. If there had been a Pharisee in, there'd have been ructions, because there were enough ructions without a Pharisee, with the Pharisees. It would have been absolute dynamite. Jesus, again, the strategist knew what to do and what not to do. But he's got a plan. Hasn't he always got a plan? Only one plan, but he's got a plan. Because while he's treading around Jerusalem and Judea and uh, Bethsaida and all these places, Capernaum, and doing signs and wonders and this, that and the other and teaching people, there's a guy doing his O-levels and A-levels. And he's doing his university course. And he does it in theology, Greek philosophy, Greek poetry, and a few other things. And he's a very, 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 very clever man. And his name is? Saul. No, Saul. Let's have it as Saul. Jesus knew about Saul, I think, over the horizon. And when the Christian church is nicely getting going and getting cosy and spreading and things are bursting out and persecution is starting, who's there the young man Saul? And he's hearing and he hears Acts chapter 7 as we know it, Stephen's defence. And the next thing is, on Saul's door, as he's going off to Damascus to round up a few more, uh, I've got a plan for you. I've had enough of you persecuting my people. Who are you? Who are you? I'm Jesus and you're persecuted. Go and tell people. Go. And he chose that man. And without that man, we wouldn't have Romans, would we? And what is Romans? That is the theological unpacking of that little box that Jesus opened on one of his what a brilliant plan. Do you like it? I think it's absolutely wonderful. Because Jesus is a strategist. It was planned. It's not by accident. It's not by coincidence. And when the time was right, he came. And when the time was right, he called Saul. And Saul did go through the mill. And he was told he would go through the mill. But by it, did he do a good job along the way? And what he's written is so good. It, we wrestle with it. I'll be 120 before I can understand Romans. Don't worry. Or being a Christian for 120 years before I can understand Romans. It's good, tough stuff. So, 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 so there's something so good there. We're going to look at Romans 3, 21 to 31, briefly. Bullet point, fast. Because I thought, well, I hope that's been helpful. I hope it helps you to talk to people and to challenge back with people and say, well, actually, if you look at it, what you're saying don't work. So let's read. Take what you want. It's a free love offering. Because the word of God is an offering. And when it's on 